So if I ask you, what is Jesus' last name, what's the first word that comes to mind? Christ, right? Is it actually Jesus' last name? No. But if his last name, if you wanted to ask, the best we would guess is it's Jesus of Nazareth. But uh, that, that Christ, that is a, it's a title, it's a status. Someone who is Christ is someone who has been anointed, chosen to be the one to do God's will. And those who were anointed were the prophets, the priests, and the kings. When it was realized that Jesus was all three, he was prophet, priest, and king, it became a shorthand way to say this. You, we don't say Jesus, who was prophet, priest, and king for the people of Judah and all of Jerusalem to serve the entire nation. We say Christ. It's a lot shorter, a lot handier. This, the focus of the second part of the Apostles' Creed, what we're focusing on for these three Sundays, focuses on Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And that gets into charged language right away. To say, our Lord, that is a statement with some meat to it. There's a German fellow named uh, Martin Niemuller. Well, he preached a sermon on uh, this, and it got him jailed because it was in the 1930s. And the way you translate Jesus is Lord into German sounds a lot like Jesus is my Führer. And that got him in trouble because someone else was claiming to, to be Führer, to claim to be in charge. And having broken the cardinal rule of making an argument, never bring up the Nazis, uh, I, still can't, I do it because I can't think of another word that has the punch there. Because I say Führer, and you know that that is someone claiming to be in charge of everything. To say Jesus is my president... You know, that just doesn't have enough meat to it, right? That doesn't have enough punch, right? To say Jesus is Lord, it, this is written, the Apostles' Creed is put together beginning in Rome in the second century. And the way that you declared yourself to be in a revolt against Rome, to the Roman Emperor, the Roman Caesar, the way you, you uh, pledged allegiance to Rome is to say Caesar is Lord, and the way you began a revolt against Rome is to say anyone else is Lord. So to say is Lord, that, that is a powerful statement. That has implications for all parts of a person's life. And so that's how we begin. We begin by saying Jesus uh, is his only son, our Lord. And that lordship is not exercised through force of arms. It is exercised through service and humility. We, we continue on saying that <clears throat> Jesus was con conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. This is not a science textbook and should not be read as such. It's getting at two things. First, it's saying that conceived by the Holy Spirit, it's saying that God's involved with this. If you look at the history of the Jewish people, the way that the Jewish people know when God is involved on a regular basis is you look at a couple who cannot have children, and when, against all odds, they do have children, they say, ah, God must have been involved in that. Abraham and Isaac. Abraham was promised that he would be a father of a great people. right? As many people as there are stars in the sky. And then he turns 100, and his wife, Sarah, turns 90, and they're, well, how's this going to go? And three strangers show up and say, you're going to have a child. And Sarah laughs. And she denies it. Oh, no, I didn't laugh. I, I believe you. <clears throat> right? And they have a child, and they name the child Isaac, which means laughter. And then Isaac and Rebekah, they can't have children. And then Rebekah prays, and God remembers her, and they have a child. And then it happens with Jacob and Rachel. Rachel is barren. Like, Jacob marries the, the two sisters, and one sister is having kids left, right, and then Rachel has no children, and, and, and she prays, and God remembers her, and she has a child. It's this continuing theme. Samson, the great judge, well, he's great, but he, he has a temper. But he, he is born to a couple that, they were barren. They weren't going to have kids. Samson, Samuel's parent, the, the pro, uh, parents, the pro, he is the prophet who begins the time of the kings of Israel. John the Baptist's parents, they did not expect to have a child. He is an old man serving at the temple, and an angel shows up and says, Zechariah, you're going to have a kid. And he goes, right? That's not going to happen. And he doesn't talk for nine months because he doesn't believe, right? And then he does. When someone has a child and no one sees it coming, oh, God must have been involved in that. And who do you least expect to have a child than Mary? It makes it crystal clear. God's involved in this. 
And second, not only was God involved in this, the, the emphasis on the virgin birth, that phrase, is on the birth part. Because the, the, the hard part to believe in second century Rome in that time and place was not that God exists. Like today, the struggle is often for folks, yeah, Jesus was human, but was he God? Back then, it was the flip. Yeah, he's God, but God would not demean himself to become fully human. No, he did. Fully human, fully birthed. This dude is the real deal. He is fully human. And because he's human, he suffers. That's the next part. He, he, Jesus suffered. To suffer as part of the human condition in this side of death, there will always be some suffering. To experience suffering doesn't mean that God isn't there. When you suffer, that doesn't mean Jesus doesn't love you, because Jesus has gone through it too. Jesus knows what suffering is. Jesus invites us to join with him in suffering. Suffering for a purpose. Suffering towards the kingdom of God. And that is something we can do. Suffering without a purpose, that's horrible. But suffering for a purpose, for a worthwhile purpose, to be able to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, to be able to work for the good of others out of the love of God, that, we can do that. And he suffered under Pontius Pilate. Now, Pontius Pilate, the fact that we point points out Pontius Pilate is making two points. First, this is an event in time. In that time period, in the second century, there were various pantheons. The Egyptian pantheon of gods, the Greek pantheon of gods. And it was a common story. Like in Egypt, there was this story. Why does the Nile flood every year? Well, the Nile floods every year because the god of fertility dies. And then in the middle of winter, the god of fertility is resurrected and brought back to life. And then the Nile floods, and yippee! And then it'll happen again next year. And the, the white reason we have spring is because the dead God is brought back to life. That, that's a common story in the pantheons of the various pagan uh, faiths of the time. And, and this is making the point that this is not a repeating occurrence. This is not something, you can't look like next year Jesus will be risen again. No, this happened once under Pontius Pilate. You can put a year on it. 33 AD under Pontius Pilate. That is when Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried. The other reason Pontius Pilate seems to be valuable to have in here is because he becomes the antithesis of Jesus. Jesus is the one who suffers for the good of others. He gives up his life out of love. He takes responsibility for the sin that is not his. And next to him, you have Pontius Pilate. Help me out, please. What is the polite term for a scum-sucking dog that I should use in the pulpit? All right, can you think of one? I'm trying to think of a better term to use for Pontius Pilate. He is the scum-sucking dog. You look at Jesus, who takes responsibility, and you look at Pilate. Because Pilate, I don't want to deal with him. Here, Herod. No, I don't want to deal with him. And they're, they're tossing him. He's like a hot potato that's being tossed between the Sanhedrin and, and the high priest and Pilate and Herod. They're all tossed. No one wants to take responsibility for what's happening here. And you see Jesus, who does take responsibility. Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried. Crucifixion, it's the ultimate shame. It's the ultimate shaming. And Pontius Pilate was brutal even by Roman standards and how often he used it, how he implemented it. Jesus was killed, body and soul, dead. And he descended into hell. That's what we read. He descended into hell, into the dead, because he was fully human and that is what happens. And he does this. It's, it's 1 Peter that lays out, 1 Peter 3.18 lays out our understanding of this. For Christ also died for, the sin, for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. And he also went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison who were once disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah. If you wonder what the Bible has to say about uh, those who died without hearing the gospel of Jesus, that, that's it. There is nowhere that Jesus will not go for those he loves. Jesus will go to hell itself to find the people who need to hear the gospel. There is no one who will not be given the opportunity to turn and to follow and to accept that forgiveness. Right? So Jesus goes to hell out of love for us. And while he is descending... <clears throat> He is dead Friday, Saturday, and, and, and Sunday, right? There are people today, some of us in this room, who understand what it is to wait 
having experienced a, tra a tragedy, the Friday, and we've not yet got to the Sunday where we're in the kingdom of God to come and we can experience things made right, to live in the Saturday, the, the wait, the pause, Jesus has done that as well. On the third day he rose again. The stone was rolled away, and it is a fascinating thing that the beginning of the good news of Easter is emptiness. Well, that's, that's the good news of Easter, right? You show up, the disciples show up first thing in the morning, and what do they see? Nothing. Easter begins with the good news that the tomb is empty. And while they are sitting there, bum-fuzzled, confused, they hear, and into the silence they hear the words, Why do you look for Jesus among the dead? He is alive. Sometimes the place we need to... If we need to find good news from Jesus, if we need to listen to God, it's the silence we need to listen into, the emptiness. That's where we can hear things the clearest. And this news that Jesus rose from the dead is the linchpin of our gospel. Without it, what are we doing here? Right? Why are we here? But with it, this is the linchpin, the base, the, the, the basis of everything we do together. Because of what happened that day, every Sunday is a mini Easter. It is always appropriate on, East, on a Sunday to sing, Christ the Lord is risen today. It is always fitting. And if I figured that out to say it earlier, we'd be singing it right after the sermon. I'm sorry. But... Uh, it, then we read that Jesus is still ascended. Jesus is still fully human, and he ascends. It's the right hand of the Father, and he entrusts us with this. And he will come again, again to judge. The fact that there is judgment tells us that our lives matter. How you live your life matters. But judging, when we think of judges, what do we usually think of? Dude in black robes, right? Someone in black robes who's about to tell you whether you're going to sleep in jail or not tonight. They, 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 order, they, they, they order something to happen, and then it happens. I think when we read the Apostles' Creed, we need to broaden our understanding of what it means to judge. Because when Jesus comes to judge, he is not just going to reconfigure and realign who sleeps where, who's in jail and who's not in jail. He's going to reconfigure and realign reality itself. And he will do so out of a deep sense of love and care for us. I am not afraid of judgment. Because I read scriptures, and I read what Jesus wants to have happen, and I'm not worried. Why? Jesus wants to heal the sick, teach, eat together. I think that sounds good. I'm not afraid of judgment, because Jesus is the one who will judge. Now, the second article of the Apostles' Creed, it lays out what we believe about Jesus. I believe in Jesus, and, and here's what it looks like. That's what it's telling us. It has helped me chew on something I, I've pondered for years, helping me get clear about uh, something I never could get my mind around. You ever heard the phrase, personal relationship with Jesus? Yeah. I, when, uh, when Jesus first got my attention, sophomore in college, I heard that phrase, personal relationship with Jesus, and other forms and permutations of that, accept Jesus into your heart and stuff like that. And I was reading all of the scripture, and so I read, I looked for that. I can't find that phrase in scripture. Personal relationship with Jesus, it's not in the Bible as far as I can tell. I could never figure out what that means or looks like or feels like or how to start it or where to begin. Uh, but I've studied scripture for a long time, and I'm fascinated by it, and as I read of Jesus, this is what I know. I know that I want to follow in his footsteps, that to follow Jesus is to know God fully, to know, I know Jesus, so I know the Father, and I know the, the Holy Spirit who Jesus sends. I know that I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I'm not sure what it, though what it feels like to have that personal relationship. So here, here's what I do know. I know that I trust him. I know I follow him. I know that my life only makes sense when I'm doing that. And, that, and this, what, what that means for me is that if I believe what Jesus says to be true, and for him to be the way, the truth, and the life, then I'm willing to suffer for him because it's worth it. Suffering for a purpose, to follow Jesus. I have found Jesus to be true to the point, not only am I willing to suffer for him, but I'm willing to invite others to do the same because I think it's worth it. And so I've, I've invited Olivia to be willing to move with me across Missouri, and she has taken that on. And there's going to be some joy there, but there'll be some suffering, and I believe it to be so true that I'm even willing to do that hardest thing. If you believe something to be true, what's the hardest thing you can do? 
ask your children to suffer for it, right? I'm willing to have my children suffer for this thing that is true to follow Jesus. This belief in Jesus is laid out in the Apostles' Creed. You notice what it doesn't talk about? It doesn't talk about what Jesus teaches, does it? Right? If, you, if you want to go find wisdom to, learn, to live by, right, Jesus says that we should uh, love our enemy. So does Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln says, I destroyed my enemy by turning him into my friend. Right? If, if you, want, you listen to Jesus say, turn the other cheek as a way of nonviolent force and to change the world, you know what, who else talks about using nonviolent force to change the world? Gandhi. Right? If you want to find wisdom to live by, there's a lot of wisdom to live by out there. What makes Jesus worthy of believing in, what makes it possible to believe his words, is who he is. The Apostles' Creed is the beginning of how to follow Jesus, and it doesn't tell us much about what he says, because before you can know why you care what he says, you have to know who he is. And I'll tell you who Jesus is. Jesus is the only Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered for us under Pontius Pilate, and he was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to hell. He went through the depths of hell itself out of a love for us. On the third day, he rose again and ascended into heaven so that he might pave the way for us to follow him into the kingdom of God. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father, and he's going to come again to make it all work out as it ought. I don't know what a personal relationship with Jesus feels like, and if you do, please throw me a bone. But here is what I do know. I know that I trust and believe in Jesus. And the reason I can do so, the reason I can pay attention to what he taught and live by it, is because of who he is. We listen to Jesus every Sunday because of who he is, and what helps us see most clearly who he is, is what this creed simplifies and crystallizes and lays out for us. Who is Jesus? Say the Apostles' Creed. Then we know why to listen to what